Okay, for this particular recipe, it calls for four and a half kilograms of light Pilsner malt, and we have 500 grams of the Vienna malt. So about 95% of the pills and 5% uh, of the Vienna malt is uh, the grain bill for this uh, recipe. So here we have a little scale, a little kitchen scale with a bowl. And what I do is I scoop uh, 1,000 grams, uh, fill, which fills up the bowl basically, and then I put it into my grain mill, which is standing by here. And then we'll go from there. So I'm just going to show you the first one. It'll be 1,000 grams, and then we'll go from there. Okay, if you're a little over, there, oh there, that's pretty good. Okay, so we'll take our bowl. So that's the first little batch of a thousand. Okay, and this this mill can probably hold uh, two or three um, kilograms, but we'll just do two, and then we'll grain, and then we'll move on from there. Okay, so you get the idea. I'll see you in a minute. Okay, so I put uh, three kilograms of the malt in the mill. I have a corded drill. It's a seven amp half inch. Uh, this mill did come with a handle, but it's guaranteed a lot easier to do with the drill it takes literally seconds to uh, to do your milling so uh, you can also have this done at your uh, your local brew supply place they can mill everything for you but it is to me I found it a lot easier and more convenient at home to do that so let's get started and uh, we'll grind this down One thing I wanted to mention, when you do get a mill, uh, it does come with a platform that you can mount to, that which goes over a pail, but uh, I've seen other people that just uh, cut out the uh, inside of the lid. They just match the opening of the mill, and they mount it directly to the lid. I think it's a lot easier that way. Okay. All right, we'll move on. Okay, so we've done four kilograms uh, so far, so now I'm going to work on the... Uh, up to five kilograms so I'll just add my 500 grams so half a kilogram and it should hopefully if the screw shop the property it should say 500 which it does okay now I'll just add another 500 and I'll get, bring this up to five kilograms Okay, here we go. So we'll mill that and then we'll move on to the next step. Okay, so the night before a brew day, I get the brewzilla out and I set it up. And I get the malt pipe, which has been hanging to dry since the last brew day. And I get the, uh, has two screens here that go inside, a fine screen and a coarse screen, which are screwed into this rod here. That's a two piece. That just drops into the bottom like that. In the main kettle, you drop in your false bottom. It has three legs like that. Don't worry, it has been cleaned. It's just a little bit faded. All right, fit it in like that. It sits on the bottom and it keeps it off the uh, element and the uh, intake for the pump. And the also the outlet here. Okay. So we take our malt pipe, we slide it in, like so. Okay. And what I'm going to do, I have some water here, actually two bottles, that uh, is regular tap water that I've uh, kind of let sit for uh, probably a month or two. Uh, they've been uh, dechlorinating. Our tap water here in Hamilton's really good. So I'm going to uh, fill this up right up to the top because the extra water I'm going to use to uh, uh, later on in the process, which I'll, I'll show you. Okay. Okay. So as you can see, I filled it within probably about an inch to an inch and a half from the very top, uh, an inch from the top of the malt pipe. So this is my sparge water and my strike water together. So I'm going to, in the morning after this is heated up to 156, I'm going to uh, 
drain off as much as I need to get it down to uh, the uh, the proper amount of water to, to make the mash. So I'll show you that in the next step. But for now, we'll put the lid on. Okay. And then we'll set our, down here on our controls, I'll show you that in a sec, how to uh, have a delayed start so it, uh, the, the water is nice and warm for us in the morning when we're ready to go. So we do this the night before, to me is the most efficient way. Okay, so we're down at the control panel. Um, I've changed it to Fahrenheit. You do that uh, from Celsius by holding the temperature button in. So for instance, if I hold it in, it changes to Celsius, but for now I'm going to put it back to Fahrenheit. Okay, so our current temperature is always on top. That's what the current temperature of the fluid is. Just below that is your target temperature. So that's what you've, um, you normally set uh, your target temperature to. And uh, the heaters will bring it up to that temperature. So right now, it's not going to go any higher than 68. It's going to maintain that uh, steady temperature um, overnight. And seven hours later, it's going to go into the next sequence. So up here, you see S1. Not sure if you can see that. Okay, you can just barely see that up there on the top left-hand corner is S1. So I've set it for seven hours from now. That's the time that this S1, sequence one, will uh, come to an end. All right, now I want to program my next sequence. So S2, it'll go from whatever the current temperature is in the kettle. Uh, it will start heating up to 156. That's my target temperature. Um, it really is 154, but by the time I take that extra water out of the kettle and I'm kind of moving things around, it's going to drop a couple of degrees. So I always set it a couple of degrees higher. Okay, so in seven hours from now, it will uh, start heating up. Now off to the side here, you have your two uh, heater control buttons. There's a thousand watt and 500 watt. So I'm only going to use 500 watt because I'm just going to have it... Uh, heat up slowly okay so seven hours from now it will go from whatever the current temperature is up to 156 and that's the time that um, I will once it reaches that temperature I'll take some of the water out and it'll be coming out of here okay uh, into a silicone tube into a, a igloo container which I'll show you igloo cooler okay hopefully that was uh, fairly clear but that's what I do the night before so by the time I wake up and uh, get get up and going, um, you know, it's pretty much up to temperature and I can start my brew day. All right, one thing I forgot to mention is uh, before you retire for the night, you do have to put it back on S1. So right now we're uh, finished programming S2. So I'm just going to go back, go through the sequences and go to S1. Now you'll notice that's at 68 degrees. Uh, I did run the program for a couple minutes to get it up to. Uh, you know, it was on 500 watt. It only took like two minutes to get up there. Normally, the uh, temperature of the water is uh, going to be uh, lower, uh, sorry, higher than the uh, target temperature. But this time of year, uh, the, the water was pretty cold in those bottles. So it did uh, come up to 68 and then shut off, which is what it's supposed to do. But right now, um, it's all set to go. You can see it's on pause there. So you want to uh, start playing your program okay so you press the play button okay now it will maintain 68 uh, if it happens to drop down the uh, the heater will come on and, and maintain 68 but that is a pretty low temperature and it uh, shouldn't move throughout the night okay so you see s1 is flashing and in seven hours from now it will go to s2 and go up to 156 okay thanks all right so it's the next morning i've uh, brought my grains in ready to be put in you can see they've been nicely milled not too fine not too coarse and this is a igloo cooler that I use for the, the sparge water and you can see that the temperature is at 156 so what I'm gonna do is drain some water out into the igloo cooler we'll do that right now okay in the meantime We'll take the lid off. Okay. 
and I'm going to let it go down to about, I usually just go down to 20 liters. Um, I don't want my mash to be too wet or too dry, and I figure uh, 20 liters is, has always worked for me. So uh, I may change that in the future, but it seems to work pretty good. So the way I tell basically is I take the cover off here, and I look down, and you can see 30, 25, and 20. So I kind of judge it. Like, you know, I just put my finger here and wait for it to come down to about 20. There's probably better methods, but I uh, just eyeball it. So when I feel it's when it's about 20, which I think it is now, I'll turn off my tap. Here's my water, which I'll uh, keep hot. Here's the other tools that you'll need for now. Here's the handle for the malt pipe, my paddle. This is the, uh, the arm for recirc. Uh, what I did is I bought a little sprayer attachment for the tube and that disperses the water over the grain you'll see that in a little bit and this is the little cover for the pipe that we have to put on now so we don't want any grains to go into that pipe because that will really mess up the system it'll clog the pump and we won't be able to recirc so always make sure you have that little cover on top when you're putting the grains in okay so yeah we have about 20 liters of water to work with for our mash and we'll get started Okay, now is the time to add our milled grains. So what I do is I add a little bit to each side of the main uh, tube. And I kind of let it sink down and get absorbed. Then I grab my mash paddle. And we'll just give it a quick stir. If you dump it all in at once, you can get what's called dough balls. Um, so you need to give it a stir and dump in a little bit more. Just to prevent any headaches later on. Now this recipe calls for a mash temperature, um, a 90 minute mash at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So I do 152 just with any heat loss during uh, recirc, but 152 works for me for this recipe. So that's what I have it at, right? It's actually 154, but when you're adding things into the liquid, it's going to drop a few degrees. So the heater will kick on automatically and bring it back up to 152 once it drops down below. So we'll give it another stir. it all in. Now admittedly this mash paddle is a little bit too big for this uh, for the bruzilla but it does a quick job of moving the grains around and I like that it's stainless steel it's easy to clean so I'm okay with that. All right and then we'll add the final bit of grains And then the next step is to, you know, some people don't put the top screen on. Um, what that is intended to do is to keep the mash bed, the grains, um, kind of at all one level and not to have it uneven. So I do tend to use it. I think it works well, but some people don't. So that'll be the next step. Okay. So there's no dough balls okay so we'll take this little piece off and I'll place the top screen on kind of have to work the tube there to line it up to come into the hole then we'll put place this back on top okay Now I leave the plug on so the uh, when we're recirking that the water doesn't go back down um, 
it seems to work okay. So what we're going to do now is hook up the recirc arm. Now I let my grain rest for 10 to 15 minutes before I start recirking. Okay, I do have a shorter tube for this. I just can't find it right now. So I'm stuck with this a little bit longer one, but normally it's about this, uh, this length here, but that's fine. Once it recirks, you'll, you'll see it to spray uh, and disperse. Okay, so I'm gonna let that rest for 10 minutes. Put the lid back on. It's gonna maintain, maintain a temperature of 152. So we'll see in 10 minutes. Okay, so it is almost 10 minutes later and we've got our recirc arm set up and the little diffuser there set up. I'll show you in a minute. And we'll check our temperature here. Okay, hanging at 150 right now, which is perfect. It'll uh, maintain 152. You see the heater just came on. So I'll give you a quick peek. So we're gonna turn the pump on Okay, now, word of advice, here you have your, your cock valve. Make sure it's not fully open if you use one of these. Even when you're recircing, you don't want it fully open because that's quite the flow. You don't really need that during the mash. So I close it to pretty much 80% to 90% closed. And this is the kind of effect you get. I'll give you a shot of the inside. Okay, so just kind of a gentle spray. Um, you can be a little bit more aggressive if you want, but for a 90 minute mash, I figure that's that's a good thing just to let it uh, be fairly um, gentle because if you go too much, you can end up with it foaming. So we'll just let it trickle and we'll be back at the end of 90 minutes. So just a quick update. We're at about 55 minutes remaining on the timer for a 90 minute mash. So that's pretty much where I set the uh, recirc arm uh, valve at that position and you can see it's uh, not foaming too much. It's going nice and slow so that that offers uh, an opportunity for the water to uh, slowly uh, seep down through the, the grain bed and uh, recirc. So uh, let's check our temperature. Yeah 152. So it hovers between 150 and 152 and the heater does a good job of maintaining that range. By the way guys here's a little tip or trick. Uh, say you want to hang something and you don't have a hook or uh, an easy way to uh, hang it up. Uh, just grab two zip ties. I have a longer one, 11 inch, and a, and a shorter one. So you take the shorter one around the, the top of the hose. And you want to make sure it's nice and tight. Alright, in the meantime you keep the longer one in there. And you secure it as tight as you can without breaking it. Okay. Now you take the longer one, make a loop and you just make yourself a loop where you can hang it on a hook. So you clip the ends off. Okay. So now what you have is it's secured to the top. It's not going to move. You can tighten it even more if you want. And then we'll just hang it up here. I'll show you in a minute. There you go. Okay, we've come to the end of our 90 minute mash. I'm gonna shut off the pump. And just let the tube come to being empty there. All right, I'm gonna close the valve. I'm gonna take this out and take the lid off at the same time. All right, and I'm gonna take the recirc arm off sure you grab it by the foam because it can get pretty hot if you grab it the other way. All right, I am going to insert our handle like that. And the next step will be to hook up. You can lift it by hand, but I have a little system here that I'll show you in a second. So I have this little pulley system I came up with. Uh, to help me lift the basket out, the, the malt pipe. Okay, so there's your handle that you hook onto there. And there's the carabiner. And up here, 
on that four joist I've you can see you put a big eye bolt and a little pulley system okay I even put a note on on here to remind me which way it is to release it because sometimes you forget when you're in a hurry so all right so what we'll do is we'll hook that up to the carabiner okay and okay so now what we do is let me get this lined up And so these little feet here have to be sitting on these legs. So yeah, I had to uh, break away there because <laughs> you kind of need two hands to do that. So uh, you have to have it sitting on the proper uh, cross pieces here, these little, little legs. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And we'll move on right, to the next, the next step. step. You can see the water is draining through the chop screen into the kettle and I've set my temperature to 222 because that's pretty much the max and I, I want to get to a boil as soon as possible okay so here's the uh, leftover water that I'm going to use to sparge okay so I have this glass uh, pyrex container that I scoop the water out okay. And we're just gonna keep doing that until all the water is gone. And we're rinsing the grains, basically getting all the, the last bit of goodness out of there into the kettle. Okay, so I'll keep doing that and then we'll move on to the next step. While I'm brewing, we have our little doggy, Nelly. She's patiently waiting for me. Hi, Nelly. Are you bored? Mm -hmm. She's four months and she's a soft coat of wheat terrier. A little tip I have is it can get pretty humid in the basement here when we're doing the brewing. So I have a little fan blowing to the outside and opposite in the basement, I have another window open. So it gets a bit of airflow going. You still get a bit uh, high humidity uh, in the room but it's not too bad once the fan is going. So I've taken the malt pipe out. I have a bucket ready in the sink. I've taken the screen and the cap off the uh, the pipe. So pretty much uh, I'm just going to dump it in a pail and go from there. So yeah, I've got my malt pipe that I need to clean, which is a, what you want to do is while you're doing your brewing, try to clean up at the same time, or else you're going <laughs> to regret at the end having to do it all at once. So as you go, just uh, clean up. And for now, uh, this is going to be coming up to a boil. So I'm just going to take my mash paddle and give it a good stir. stir. All right, so the uh, all the mixture is going to come together and we're sitting at about 20 20 26 20 about 25 liters almost 24 liters so with the boil which is a one hour boil we should come down to about 23 liters 22 liters okay so while i'm waiting for my kettle to come to a boil i have in the sink here i have some of the uh, screens I'm going to clean. I recommend buying one of these little um, screens for the, the drain as well. It'll stop any uh, grain that comes off and going in there and create any clogs. So let's get started. Uh, Okay, I'm going to come back to you in a minute. Okay, I got all the uh, screens cleaned and the malt pipe and the recirc arm, everything's clean and put away. You can see that we're starting to foam up a bit here. We're at about 180 degrees, so it should start boiling at about 211, 212. 
Um, uh, it's different every time based on the sugar content of the wort. So anyway, in the meantime, I had pre-weighed two ounces of Hallertow, and we have an uh, Irish Moss tablet there too to go in at 15 minutes prior to the end of the boil. Okay, so I'll see you in the next step. So one uh, word of warning I want to say is, uh, you can see right now we're just under 200 degrees. If you had a higher water level than this, um, this is generally okay. If you uh, had a little more water after your uh, sparge, be very careful. Don't walk away and not pay attention to your your wort here uh, because you could have a boil over. It happened to me once. Um, I had more water in here than this and I did step away and sure enough I had brown foam all over the uh, the insulator here, the, uh, the foam uh, wrap. So yeah, it can be a big mess if you're not paying attention. So make sure you're always aware and be, and be in close proximity when it's getting close to 200 degrees. Anything above 200, you gotta be here. Okay, so we're at 212 degrees and you can see that the foam and proteins are starting to build up. Um, in order to prevent a boil over, which may happen, um, I just use this handy dandy little screen um, and I take some of that off the top. So to me, this I consider this the start of the boil. I'm going to be adding my hop shortly. I'm just going to first take off some of this foam. And you'll see underneath that we have a fairly good rolling boil. But yeah, you want to clear this off first. Dump it into your sink or into a container. And underneath, you can see that we have a pretty active boil going. All right. So, what I'm going to do is set my timer. Okay. I'm going to start it, set that aside, and I have measured out two ounces of Hallertow. It is 60 minutes right now, so I'm going to add that. Okay, now what you can also do is uh, get a spoon and kind of stir the inside, but for now I'll let it absorb the, uh, the boiling water, and later on you can always just stir it up to make sure that you get uh, um, a good interaction between the hops and the wort. Okay, so we'll see you in the next step. Okay, so I have my spent grains here. And Nellie's watching me. Hey, Nellie. And we're going to put it in the composter. So this is the middle of winter here. In my region of Canada. It is February 12th today. So in the summertime, you got to be careful when you compost this stuff, it really creates a, uh, a well, let's just say a unique aroma. I wouldn't recommend it unless you really mix it in with dirt and other compost, but uh, be nice to your neighbors and uh, probably wouldn't compost it. But in the winter time, it's fine. And there you go, we have a steaming hot pile of used grains. All right, put the lid back on. And secure it. So no raccoons get in, no critters, and there you go. Okay, we're at about uh, 47 minutes. Uh, we got a fairly decent boil going. I would call that a rolling boil. Uh, I did stir in the hops, which you can't see because of the fog steam. And we are at 212, which it kind of maxes out at, to be honest, um, even with this jacket. Um, yeah, it's about as high as you get, uh, not much more than 212, 213. Okay, so we're at, like I said, 47 minutes, and we'll see you at 15 to do the uh, uh, Irish Moss uh, clearing uh, tablet edition. Okay, we're at uh, 15 minutes left in the boil. 212 degrees has been holding steady. We're going to add our Irish Moss tablet. Let it do its thing. It does tend to foam up a bit, 
when you add that tablet but uh, we'll see you at the end of the boil so another thing I do at the end of the boil is I want to drain my hop uh, basket so I have this other little pulley and I just bring this up and hook it to it okay sorry for the steam and I just raise it up and as you can see once it stops spinning um, it will drain out what's left in that basket you don't have to do this I just find it easy for it to drain and I don't want to waste that nice hop water um, so yeah we're close to the end of the boil and that's usually what I do within uh, five minutes of the end of the boil okay so we wrapped up the boil um, I don't know if you can see that but we are at roughly about 23 liters it's hard to see but that's pretty much where we want to be for our batch which is about five gallons five and a bit okay so we'll come down here turn off our burners and we can see that the temperature was holding steady at 212 all the time so down here i have a food grade hp de um a cube basically it's a water cube it holds five just over five gallons so when I cool, I use this in the winter time to uh, cool down the hot wort. I give it uh, overnight to cool in, in my uh, cold cellar, and it works very well as a cooling uh, method. Okay, so I'll come back and we'll show you that process. Before we drain into the cube, um, we'll take a nice uh, long stirring process here to get the whirlpool effect. And what that does, it kind of gets all the matter, the hot matter and, and the proteins and everything kind of into the center of the kettle. So you give it a stir for I would say a minute or two and then you let it come uh, to a rest. So give it a few minutes to rest and what's going to happen is the hot matter and the proteins and all that will end up in the center of the bottom of the kettle away from your drain so you're not really kind of adding all that crap down into your your cube right okay so give it a good stir give it a few minutes to settle and then we'll go on to the next step okay so we waited the uh, 10 to 15 minutes for the whirlpool effect to happen and hopefully the most of the crud will be in the center and not be close to the drain so next step is to drain into our cube slowly open this Okay. Now, warning, this will be obviously very hot. We're still talking over 200 degrees of hot wort. So, let it fill up. Now, the key to this uh, hot cubing, uh, cooling, is to make sure that you have no air at all, or very little air left in the cube by the time you're done filling it. Uh, the more air you have, the, the higher the risk of contamination, although they say the risk is very minimal because you're dealing with very high temperatures and not much is going to be growing in that environment. So do your best to fill the cube up, up as much as possible, including the handle, which is hollow. Again, this is a food grade HDPE. It can handle the heat. It's not going to melt on you. It's not going to impart any uh, toxins or anything into the wart. So it's uh, commonly used for a cooling uh, method and that's what I use for non hoppy beers some of the hoppier beers I still use my uh, my coil my copper coil uh, cooling method so um, I can show you that in a separate video but for now this is the method that we're going to use today all right so I moved the cube to my cold cellar which is where I keep uh, our uh, pantry goods and, and my grains but uh, it's pretty cool in here. It's about, uh, you know, in the 50s. So that'll be good for a, a cooling down to a, a pitching temperature for tomorrow. So we'll see you then at the next step. All right. So it's the next day. I've taken the cube out of the uh, cold cellar. And what I've done is put it up on a shelf right next to the cold cellar here and kind of uh, angled it so it's angled back. So uh, when I open the lid, the uh, 
most of the warts going to be in the handle and not all over the floor. So I have like a a puppy pad kind of a absorbent pad here just in case. But yeah, this is kind of the little procedure I go through to take an original gravity before I uh, uh, transfer the wart into a pail and then into the fermenter. Sometimes directly into the fermenter, depending how it goes. So let's take a temperature to start with. Okay, so we have about 48 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're going to have a wine thief here. We're going to hopefully be able to get some out without spilling, just to take out enough to do a density of original gravity. Okay, and we'll transfer it over here into our density beaker. Good to have a little tray underneath in case you have any spillage. No one likes to clean up, right? All right, we'll see where we're at here. I'm gonna add a little bit more. There we go. So it's floating. And we'll have a look at that. We're at, well, anyway, I'll grab the camera and I'll show you where we're at. All right, so there's a decent close up. So we're at about 1,048, 1,046 in that range, which is good. That's good for my original gravity for this uh, style. And uh, we're ready to pitch. All right, uh, so I have my auto siphon here which I've sanitized I'm gonna place it in and just be careful that you don't go too far in to start with all right let's get that into our fermenter get the flow going and then once it's going we can bring it down further and we'll just let it fill the fermenter up from there As you can see there's still some uh, residual hot matter and proteins in the bottom of the cube so we're going to try to avoid sucking some of that into the fermenter but if a little bit gets in that's uh, that's not a big deal while i'm waiting for the uh, work to transfer into the fermenter just wanted to mention the yeast i'm using escarpment labs is uh, fairly local to me in guelph ontario uh, they had produced this really great strain of yeast called kolsch ale so it's similar to a lager yeast. Um, it does best when it's uh, fermented uh, at lower temperatures, which is good here for the winter. But you can also do it in wa warmer climates as well. Um, I do it in the summer as well with the same results. So yeah, that's the type of yeast I'm going to be using. We're ready today. to pitch the yeast. Uh, before we do that, I'll just show you the level we ended up at, which is just under 23 liters, so in just under six gallons roughly of wort. So. I've uh, sanitized the scissors and the pack of yeast, and I have clean hands. It's very important uh, at this stage to have be very uh, uh, sanitation friendly because uh, any little bug can uh, affect your brew. Although it hasn't happened to me in a very long time, but it's always good to give everything a good spray before you start. So we'll cut this open. Okay, give me one minute and I'll get the rest out. All right, that was kind of difficult to do with one hand. So um, I'll show you what I did is I, uh, I took the thief and I put a, uh, some of the wort in here, shook it up really well, and I got the residual yeast from the bottom to mix in. Now I'm just going to pour the remainder in.
You can do that multiple times if you need to. Okay, a little bit left in the bottom there, but we're not too worried about that. And there we go. Our yeast has been pitched. I do not stir it. I just let it do its thing. All right, it's a few days later. I moved it actually into my uh, my normal brewing area because it was a little too cold to get started um, in the cellar. So now it's uh, going good. I might move it back uh, into the colder area, but we'll see. All right, it's uh, two days later. It took a while for fermentation to start because of the pretty cold uh, winter temperatures we have. So the cellar is pretty cold. It takes a while to get going, but once it does, it uh, it's pretty steady. So, and I did put the fermenter up on, uh, or put the bulb on the bottom of the fermenter and raised it up a little bit with some towels just so the bulb's not sitting on the floor. So there we go. It is going. Okay, I've uh, harvested some yeast from the Kolsch and transferred into a carboy. And I'll let that settle for, uh, for as long as it takes. Okay. So the final gravity was 1,005. We started at 1,047, so it worked out to 5.5%. So fairly light and drinkable beer, uh, nice and clear, crisp, and I hope you uh, give it a shot. It's a fairly easy recipe to make. So thanks for watching. Subscribe, like, and ring the notification bell for more videos. I'll be sure to do a um, continuation on uh, different styles of beer, and we'll see you next time.